Okay, today we are going to begin our study of a, an incredible book by Norbert Wiener called Cybernetics, um, the study of control and communication in animals and humans. One second. And I highly recommend this book. Uh, it may put some people off because of the title, especially the word cybernetics. But if that puts you off, just don't worry about it. Um, the book is, I would say it's, it's, it's an essential book uh, to understand the modern uh, society that we're living in, whether it's from a philosophical, uh, scientific point of view, or just a sociological point of view even. So um, go ahead and get yourself a copy of Norbert Wiener's Cybernetics and read it with joy. Um, before we get into the actual meat of the first chapter, uh, I want to talk a little bit about the introduction, uh, which was written by Wiener, and which is really kind of a social and political history of cybernetics uh, and how it was born in the modern era. Uh, and it was basically born in and around um, the problems uh, which were created by modern technology and its applications in modern warfare, uh, which was obviously scaring the world to death, um, especially with regard to fighter planes uh, and their ability to, you know, drop bombs and also the development of bombs and their ability to annihilate the planet. So uh, we had this incredible technology and it was very, very dangerous. And um, that's how Wiener approaches the introduction. He's talking about trying to look at science in a new way, trying to get away from specializing so much and trying to bring everybody together uh, and to look at things in kind of a holistic and philosophical way. And that uh, he says it's a spiritual necessity. He actually uses that term. Uh, and I think the reason that he did is because uh, some of the other notable scientists were having these existential crises uh, with regard to the H-bomb. We know that famous saying, um, I have become death. Uh, George Kitschakovsky, some of these people uh, were going out of their mind uh, with the weight of the destructive forces they had unleashed. And um, it is in this context that cybernetics, the modern version of cybernetics, not the platonic version, but we've looked at how it has developed over the centuries, and now we come to kind of a head where cybernetics is being put to the test. Will it be able to explain the bind or the double bind into which humanity has gotten itself? Now, I was thinking about uh, the philosophy of our existence, and I... I was thinking about uh, Wiener's applications of that, and I came up with three things I want to talk about. Um, first of all, um, what we've done with the H-bomb really is just accelerate uh, the speed of death. We're all dying, okay? Our bodies are dying, and the minute we're born, even though some of these processes, um, you know, they accelerate as you grow up, you actually are in an extremely tight frame uh, time-wise, and the process that is going to kill you, the degeneration of your body, and is initiated in the minute and the second that you are born. So um, that's one thing to keep in mind. When we create this H-bomb, we are merely accelerating the speed at which we kill or die. Okay, we're not really doing anything in a different dimension yet. Uh, and the same is true of, you know, our response to some of these things is to say, well, we're going to create this transhuman movement and, you know, we're going to give ourselves bionic hearts and uh, maybe, you know, genetically enhanced blood composition and uh, we won't have to die. But again, we're still stuck in the space-time continuum. So even if we extend uh, our lives indefinitely uh, before we were compacting them with this H-bomb, we're just going to hurry up and break out of it quickly 
and now we're just trying to uh, prolong it indefinitely. Um, but I think what Wiener was trying to get at was the communication between time and eternity. That's the key. And we know that Einstein was investigating the outskirts of that. Uh, and Bergson and some of these other um, mathematicians and physicists. Uh, and that's what we have to look at there. We're talking about communication of a, a state that we're trying to achieve, really, which is eternity. It isn't just the prolongation of time, because that means we didn't break out of this dimension, okay? We, or, or if we don't need to break out of it, we need to transform it. Uh, and the time that we're in, as Wiener says, we're an arrow shot in one direction. And uh, in contrast to the Newtonian universe where time was reversible, uh, keep that in mind. Um, he's saying, you know, technology and, and the way we're going is, is shooting us in this direction of irreversible time. Uh, and, that, and that's because we're human. You know, we can look at the stars and say, wow, they're, they're immutable. And that's what we did originally. And then we had this whole Copernicus revolution and Galileo. Oh, it's a you know, heliocentric universe. Well, we also have to remember that time is a result of our perspective. You know, we see things rotating slowly in the heavens because we are so small and far away from them. Uh, but if we were as big as the sun, uh, it wouldn't seem that slow. In fact, it's the sun as we know now. Um, or the Earth is hurtling, hurtling through space uh, at an incredible rate of speed. So it's the relationship between us, our arrow shot from life to death, uh, and the rotations of these spheres, uh, because that's how we calculate time, obviously. So we have to kind of get a new perspective, a wiener perspective, on the whole world that we're inhabiting here. Uh, okay. And that might give us some hope not in a transhuman way to fight uh, the I am death philosophy, but in fact to find the, the, the key to transform our time into eternity where time no longer exists. Um, <clears throat> the second thing I wanted to mention is uh, something that was, was, was coming into my mind as I read this fantastic book by Wiener, and that is when I was studying calculus uh, in high school and college, I was a very undisciplined uh, individual if I didn't really care about what I was reading. And at the time, I didn't really care to learn calculus. I was, I was focusing on um, literature. And I, I thought calculus was interesting, but I just did not want to be made to study it. Uh, and therefore, I learned geometry when I was like 14 or 15. And I just said, you know what, if I have to do calculus, I'll just use geometry. When I got to college, I didn't go to my calculus class. Uh, and I thought, well, I'll take the exam and I'll just use my geometric formulas. I'll, I'll remember my old geometric formula. Well, you know, when I got t down to the reading period, I realized it wasn't going to be quite that simple. Calculus had its own set of laws. And if I, I, I now that I go back and look at it, geometry is a lot like... Um, what Wiener talks about being the Newtonian concept of things. You know, it's kind of reversible because he talks about the stars and astronomy as being very Newtonian and then meteorology and the weather as being very Bergsonian, okay? But if, if in my, when I was thinking about it, the geometry uh, was very Newtonian, Hegelian, you know, the absolute and all of that because you're talking about fixed shapes and then how you calculate the relationships and ratios of the lines and those things. And when you enter into the calculus world, you introduce that concept of the, you know, the wave, you know, it goes up and down. And that's time, you know. So you're talking about the Bergsonian time, uh, which to me, it's an introduction of something um, that we cannot control or reverse. Uh, and uh, the third thing that I wanted to highlight is that we have experience of this is in our daily lives all the time. Uh, we may not think of them as calculus and geometry or Newtonian, Bergsonian, but we do. And one of the most common ones is if you're throwing a baseball and you're trying to hit it, and some of these uh, pitchers throw the ball so fast 
You say, well, gee, you know, how, how in the world uh, does the batter connect with that speed? His, his, he can't travel that fast. His hand can't travel that fast. But there's a communication going on neurologically, you know, biologically, um, metaphysically, whatever, you know. And that makes it possible in a mysterious way for him to connect with the ball, okay? Uh, and you could calculate that on all kinds of sine curves and I don't know, whatever you want to do if you're a calculus teacher. And, and it's fascinating. But another example of it that we use all the time is you're trying to get onto the highway uh, and you know, you're trying to accelerate to the point where you're going to be going the same speed as the rest of the travelers there that you're going to be merging with. And if you do that in a little car like the one I have, you're very conscious of your velocity and your size uh, and the huge difference between your car and these guys that are in these SUVs that are shooting by. Uh, and if they collided with you, um, they would crush you. So you get a very um, salient and immediate sense of the, um, the velocities and collisions and the things that Wiener was looking at with the aircraft uh, and how to shoot down you know, an enemy aircraft from a plane and all that negative feedback that Jim Piccarello was trying to explain to me weeks ago and I, I said, what are you talking about? Well, now I know because I've been reading cybernetics, control and communication. Okay, so having gone through those three factors, uh, the factor of we want to communicate time with eternity. We don't just want to keep accelerating time or, or drawing it out. It's not what we want. Uh, hopefully. Maybe that'll be the key. The second thing is uh, geometry and calculus is the kind of the setup that Wiener starts out from. He doesn't use it. That He doesn't talk about it like that. He talks about a Newtonian astro astronomy versus Bergsonian meteorology. Uh, and he kind of blends all these sciences into his own worldview, which is very good. Uh, and then the third thing is use your own experiences, your baseball, uh, your car, uh, and other various. If you've ever tried to catch a butterfly with your hand, uh, that's another way of thinking about, you know, random chaotic movements, velocities, uh, control and communication. So having gone through that little introduction, uh, I'm now going to uh, introduce you to the first chapter of cybernetics, uh, which Wiener chooses to call Newtonian and Bergsonian time. And I'm sure he does that deliberately. He's a very intelligent man. Uh, and so he begins by quoting this little German poem that was a, a child childhood poem uh, about the do you know how many stars are in the sky? Do you know how many clouds there are? You know, and it almost sounds like what God said to Abraham in the Jewish scriptures. You know, look up in the sky. Can you count the stars? No, you know. Uh, but Wiener says, in fact, stars are almost a perfect um, type of phenomena to count uh, because they're fixed in, 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 in a way and they're definite. And they're, they're predictable in a way, okay? And the Newtonian imagery, which came from the Copernicus thing, the Galileo thing again, uh, was that these spheres were in rotating around the sun, and, and they were fixed in their movements. And yet, uh, meteorology is a very young science. Meteorology uh, teaches us all about how um, clouds go back and forth. And it's, it's chaotic. And so uh, that is the introduction to perhaps not only the first chapter, but the entire book, the clouds versus the stars, and a third image, uh, which is the human being, which is Wiener likens to an arrow shot into this dimension, uh, which is traveling in only one direction. Uh, and cannot reverse itself. It can contemplate the reversal of other systems, but its own individual system, it cannot reverse. So that's our lesson for today. 
and next time